Jump boy. Whoa! <laughs> Jump. <laughs> you know, you really gotta love when gaming studios try to scare you, create unsettling experiences, or adapt horror properties into 8-bit video games. Not only did you have to develop a game while dealing with massive hardware constraints, but you also had to inject an element of horror into it. And today, we're gonna take a look at some of these games. Whether they're for the NES, the Master System, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, or the Sega Game Gear. So let's check out some 8-bit horror video games. We begin with Frankenstein on the NES, and this game is way better than it has any right to be. For starters, the game is filled with anime cutscenes and dialogue segments. You play as a dude trying to rescue Emily, a kidnapped girl from the clutches of Frankenstein. And yes, he's actually called Frankenstein in this version. He's not the monster, he's just Frankenstein. And the game plays like a more straightforward version of Castlevania 2. Instead of getting lost and not knowing where to go, you start in a city and need to enter the various buildings where you'll find permanent upgrades. Defeating enemies can also drop weapons like clubs or fireballs. And it seems that in this universe, Frankenstein is the equivalent to Dracula in Castlevania. Because you literally have to fight the demonic hordes of hell to get to Frankenstein. I mean, hell! You even fight against death itself on the first level! Well, not death itself. You can't kill death. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, that makes sense. Take that, Castlevania! And I would love to know how Frankenstein enlisted the help of a water dragon as one of his minions. Though, then again, this has to be the suckiest water dragon I've ever seen. Because he literally goes down with just three punches from a regular human. You also gotta love how the village elder just randomly picks you as their savior. Even your character is confused that they're putting so much faith in you. Overall, this game is amazing. I came into this one expecting a quick cash grab. And instead, I found a hidden gem for the NES. It's pretty clear Bandai saw the success of Castlevania and tried to replicate it using a different literary monster. And you know what? They did an amazing job. I highly recommend this one. Next up, we have Alien Tree for the NES. Here, you play as Ripley and you need to go through the various levels and rescue prisoners from Xenomorphs and Facehuggers. There's a good chance some of you might be familiar with the Mega Drive version of this game, which is an amazing movie to video game adaptation. And the NES version does a decent job at translating that into the weaker 8-bit hardware. You begin already fully equipped with every weapon in the game and need to manage their ammo as you go around shooting aliens and rescuing prisoners. The problem is that it's very easy to get lost in these levels and the time limit you're given is also really tight. I could barely get past the first level even after multiple attempts. But if you lose due to a timeout, you get a cool chest bursting animation from the various prisoners you did not rescue on time. And that alone arguably makes this game worth it. There's also a Master System version which features better graphics and more colors. The sound does take a hit when compared to the NES, but honestly, not as much as you might think. I used to think that this was just a straight port of the NES version or vice versa, but it's actually not. The level layouts are different. I generally found the layouts on the Master System version to be much cleaner and closer to its 16-bit counterpart. For example, on level 1, you need to rescue 4 prisoners on the NES and 6 prisoners on the Master System. And yet, I completed the Master System level on my first try but kept running out of time on the NES version. 
Personally, I recommend the Master System, but the NES version is fine too. But if you really want the proper Alien Tree experience, the Sega Genesis is what you should be aiming for. Alien Tree would also come out for the Nintendo Game Boy, though this is a completely different game and much worse for it. This is basically an action-adventure game, and I've seen it described as Zelda-like. And, I mean, I guess that's somewhat accurate. Once again you play as Ripley, and you need to go around the prison and collect weapons, keycards, ammo, and solve puzzles to progress. Along the way, you'll occasionally be interrupted with cutscenes as some story segments seem to run on a hidden timer. Xenomorphs and facehuggers will keep respawning, but most of your weapons are basically useless and the ammo is extremely limited, so it's best to simply avoid them. Honestly, my biggest issue with this game is how cryptic it is, and it does not help that the graphics and sound are just average at best for the system. So unless you check out a guide, you're gonna spend a lot of time wandering around not knowing what to do or where to go. I should know, I used to own this game, my brother bought it for me as a kid and I tried to like it. God, did I try to like this. But man, no, this game just plain sucks. But let's keep this alien train going with Alien Syndrome for the Master System. This is a top-down shooter ported from the arcade to Sega's 8-bit console. I've never played the arcade version and this Master System port is… it's fine. Once again, you need to go around shooting aliens and rescuing people while under a strict timer. Along the way, you'll find weapon power-ups, most of which are honestly not that great. But whatever. The sound does do a good job at keeping things tense, especially if you're using the FM sound synthesizer. Enemies are also always respawning, but it's usually best to simply avoid them and just keep looking for the prisoners before the timer runs out. Once you find all of them, you then head for the exit and fight a boss. Rinse and repeat for every level. I feel this game's biggest issue is that the action is good, but not great. I feel the weapons are not as fun as they could have been, and the aliens mostly just seem to wander around aimlessly, so it gets a little boring. Overall, a decent, if unspectacular game. Alien Syndrome would also be brought to the Game Gear, and this is a little better than the Master System port. The introduction states that this takes place 5 years after the first game, but as far as I can tell, the aliens and the bosses are all the same, so I think this is more of an enhanced port. Once again, you go around the various levels rescuing people, but this time you have a map, which massively cuts down on the aimless wandering. Additionally, the music is massively improved. Sure, it lost the foreboding appeal of the first one, but in return you get a much more action-based soundtrack that fits the gameplay much better. I also feel the graphics and animations are a little better in this version. Overall, I think this one strays more from the arcade original, but I also think that it's the better one of the two 8-bit Sega ports. Ken Sidon is an action platformer for the Master System. Thematically, it falls under the medieval Japanese horror we've seen in other more popular games like Genpei Tomaden. Here, you play as a samurai and you need to reach the Emperor's Palace. At the end of each level, you're brought to a map where you choose your next destination based on your adjacent regions. Now, the cool thing here is that if you want, you can just make a beeline for the palace and ignore everything else. But doing so means you will not find all the upgrades the game has for you. See, as you defeat bosses, you gain new abilities like the high jump or additional sword moves, and these will stay with you permanently. Additionally, along the way you'll find items that increase the power of your sword, and some regions will also have training grounds where you can increase your maximum health. But these training grounds are extremely difficult and time-consuming not helped by the fact that if you lose a life, you lose all the upgrades you've gotten except for the ones you gained by defeating bosses. And this is honestly the game's greatest downfall. You should have been able to keep all the upgrades even after dying. 
Other than that though, this game is amazing! The graphics look almost like a 16-bit game, and when you add the FM sound to it, it ends up feeling more like an early Mega Drive game than it does a Master System title. Alone in the Dark – The New Nightmare is a survival horror game in the vein of Resident Evil for the Game Boy Color. And it looked honestly incredible. I know that looking at the emulator footage today, this game seems like an eyesore, but much like Alien 3, I also own this game. And let me tell you, seeing this game run on a Game Boy Color was a sight to behold. Exploring the mansion in a pseudo 3D world, picking up clues, keys and solving puzzles was just so much fun. Once you get past the wow factor, the game itself isn't all that great. The sound is minimalistic, which is fine on occasions, but makes the game feel dull and lifeless in the long run. The few bits of music you do get are also horrible and highly repetitive. Additionally, due to the nature of the graphics, it's very easy to miss a door or a walkable scenery, while other times the 3D effect just completely fails with the screens changing in angles that do not make any sense, or taking you to parts of the room that also do not make much logical sense. Also, it seems that the engine cannot handle enemies or other moving objects on screen, so you're often getting interrupted by random encounters where you're sent to this more traditional isometric camera. Here, you need to shoot your enemies while taking into account your ammo levels. So, yes, this is a Resident Evil style game with random encounters. And no, they do not work well. Not only is there no tension because you have no control on when the next fight will be, these fights are boring and incredibly easy. Overall, I say give this one a go if you see it for sale and you have a Game Boy Color on hand. It's worth it for the graphics alone. But if you're gonna play it on an emulator, I think your time is better spent elsewhere. But if you want a real Resident Evil experience, then why not play Resident Evil with Resident Evil Gaiden for the Game Boy Color. And boy, I do not like this game. First of all, I hate the art style. I mean, just look at what they did to poor Barry here. What is it? Capcom outsourced this one to a British game developer, and I get that bringing the Resident Evil experience to the Game Boy Color was always going to be a tall order, but I just could not get into this one at all. And I'm not sure why. Maybe it's the objective-based mission design, instead of using the more free-form nature of its 32-bit counterparts. Or maybe it's the fact that you can just simply run around most zombies, thereby avoiding them completely. Or maybe it's the fact that I genuinely hate the combat, which controls just like playing a golf game. But I just absolutely hated this one. But if you're looking for more ambitious Resident Evil ports, then how about Resident Evil on the NES? Yes, really. This is a bootleg remake of the first Resident Evil game made to fit within the constraints of the NES, and the loving care and attention with which they rebuilt this game and all its items, puzzles and events is beyond impressive. The intro cutscene was remade and placed in the game. The several dialogue sections, cutscenes and locations are all here. And because of that, I had way more fun playing this game than I did Resident Evil Gaiden. Sadly though, not everything is perfect. The combat was taken straight from Resident Evil Gaiden, and it's as bad here as it was there. Aiming is difficult, you waste a ton of ammo, and it's just not fun. And for some reason, I have a really hard time going upstairs or entering and leaving doors. I don't know what it is, but there's something I'm clearly not doing right. And some things were cut, like the Jill Sandwich dialogue, or the puzzle in the statue room. But then again, if you want to play 8-bit Resident Evil, then why not play the one that was being helmed under Capcom before being cancelled? This is Resident Evil for the Game Boy Color, and it sets out to do the exact same thing as the NES port. This is a full-on remake of the original game for the Nintendo 8-bit Color handheld, and I'd argue that this is even more impressive than the NES game. 
for one thing, the tank controls are back and they're honestly even tankier here than they were on the PS1 or Sega Saturn. At this point, it feels like Jill was the left child of a rusted out tank and a busted up semi truck, and I'm all in on this level of jank. But perhaps even more impressive is the combat, in that it plays just like the original Resident Evil. Yes, none of that golfing minigame from the previous two titles. No, now we have full blown Resident Evil tank control combat, and it is amazing. Amazingly jank, that is. The puzzle from the statue room is back as well, as are many of the elements that were removed from the NES game, including the room where Barry saves you from the descending roof. But for some reason, they removed the Jill Sandwich dialogue. Cowards. It's a shame that this port was never completed and instead we got Resident Evil Gaiden, because this to me is the far better game, and one I highly recommend to all fans of the first Resident Evil title. Dracula. Moving on to more classical territory, we have Bram Stoker's Dracula on the Sega Master System. This is a pretty standard platformer, with its major standout feature being the copyright infringing question mark blocks. Somehow, Nintendo either did not notice or didn't care about these, because as far as I know, nothing came of this. Anyway, based on the movie of the same name, Bram Stoker's Dracula is a good, if unremarkable platformer. You go from left to right, collect power-ups and shoot down monsters. Don't get me wrong, it's a fun game, but it lacks something to make it a standout title. The weapons are good and fun to use, but they're all fairly generic, and so are the enemies and levels. The graphics are pretty good though, making use of the Master System's high color palette, which makes everything feel nice and colorful. Too colorful at times. Personally though, I especially like the torches in the backgrounds. But the music on the other hand is incredibly annoying. I get they were trying to go for a horror vibe, but they really should have tried something different. Overall, a good game, if a bit generic. But Bram Stoker's Dracula would also launch for the NES, where it suffers from the exact same issues as its master system counterpart, and the graphics also took a hit. I mean, the torches don't even move now, and the music is just as bad here as it was for the master system. Again, not a bad game, you could certainly do worse. But there's way better stuff out there. Still, if you're that set on playing this, go for the master system version. Creepy Brawlers is a modern game for the NES published by Mega Cat Studios, and it's basically a horror-themed punch-out, where instead of fighting against Glass Joe or Soda Popinski, you fight against zombies, killer brides and the devil. Yes, the actual devil. If you've played Punch-Out, then you've already played this, it's exactly the same thing. Except that here, there is a slight delay in your inputs that I've never felt in the original game. I also feel your enemies are nowhere near as expressive as their Nintendo counterparts. So I guess you could say that this is a slightly less good Punch-Out. It's still a fun game, but I would just stick with the original. Dark Seed is another bootleg game for the NES. This time, it's a port of a point and click adventure game for the MS DOS of the same name. And, uh, wow, that is such a weird choice. I mean, I'll give it this the MS DOS game is super creepy, and at times it can be downright unsettling due to HR Giger's art style. But despite the impressive art and cutscenes, it was a pretty terrible adventure game. I should know, I own it. The game is terrible. But man, do I love that box. It's so pretty. But porting this? A below average point and click adventure game from the MS DOS to the NES? And ported by a Chinese bootleg developer of all things? I swear, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> 
But yeah, the game isn't translated, and the only good thing about the original, by which I mean the cutscenes, have now been reduced to a few stills that lose all their horror value. I was able to advance in this game because I can still recall some of the puzzles from the PC original, and they all seem to carry over, so that's good. But this is just not a good game. Ambitious? Yes. Good? No. But then again, the original game wasn't that great to begin with. Ah, Friday the 13th. This was one of my favorite classic Angry Video Game Nerd episodes, and I came into this one fully expecting to hate this game. But much to my surprise, this game is honestly incredible. I mean, did you even know this was made by Atlas? And I'm not even kidding when I say that playing this game gave me some serious Megami Tensei and Shin Megami Tensei vibes. Ok, so you play as 6 camp counselors and you can switch between them at any time. Each camp counselor has different stats and is on a different part of the map. But you can just easily walk or rowboat to where you need to go and you'll never really get lost because the map does a good job at letting you know where you are. And the world is also not as big as the map makes it seem. You can get from any point A to point B in just under 3 minutes. As you explore the world, you'll be attacked by monsters, which you can kill by throwing stones, but they'll also drop knives, which can cause more damage, as well as lighters, which you can use to light fireplaces to keep Jason away. Also, I love the 3D view of when you go into each cabin, which not only reminds me of the Megami Tensei games, but the music is eerie and fits the mood well without being irritating like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Your job is to light every fireplace and protect the children, all while Jason will constantly attack you at random points and the fight changes depending on where you are. So if you're outside the cabins, it's a side scroller battle. If you're on the boat, you need to avoid them. And if you're in a cabin, you fight in this over-the-shoulder camera. This is honestly impressive stuff, and being constantly chased by Jason reminds me of the nemesis from Resident Evil 3. You never know when he's going to show up and it becomes a generally tense battle when he does. And when you lose, your camp counselor dies and you have to switch to a different one. Seriously, why is this game so good? And it manages to be good while being faithful to the movies. All my life I was told that this game was horrible, and instead I found an incredible hidden gem for the system. One that is just unfairly maligned. But I'll tell you what's not good. Robo Demons. Robo Demon. I hope you like that intro screen because that's the best thing in the entire game. This game is part shmup, part platformer and all of it is awful. Though I shouldn't be surprised, because this is a bootleg game created by Color Dreams, a studio who you might know better under their second name, Wisdom Tree. Yes, this is the same studio behind Super Noah's Ark 3D and all those religious NES games. Except now, they made a game where you shoot robot demons in space with your boomerang. Sadly though, the scrolling is choppy and it seems there is only one song in the entire game. There are also no power-ups or weapon pickups, and it's just not a very good game. Honestly, the voice samples are the most impressive thing about it. So yeah, this one goes straight to the trash pile. Speaking of games I don't like, is it me or is the NES version of Ghosts and Goblins just not very good? Choppy scrolling, poor graphics, annoying music and of course immensely difficult. I get that it was an early NES game, but boy, this one has not aged well. If you want a better 8-bit rendition of Ghosts and Goblins, then why not check out the Game Boy Color version? It runs way smoother, has better music and the controls feel more responsive too. Or you could play Ghouls and Ghosts for the Master System, an incredibly ambitious port which uh, has its ups and downs. I mean, it looks great, it looks absolutely great, for the most part. And also for the most part, it plays really well. I mean, the game even has a shop that as far as I know is exclusive to this version. But some levels can look pretty ugly, with barely any backgrounds and sometimes it slows down so much that Arthur stops being responsive. 
Look at this part. I'm pressing the fire button, but Arthur just isn't shooting. It's an ambitious port and I still like this version, but it needs some degree of patience. Speaking of ghouls, how about Ghoul Grind? A modern game for the NES released in 2021. This is an endless runner where you switch between two characters on the fly. The dude skeleton jumps lower, but has a double jump. You can also throw weapons at enemies and blocks to destroy them. However, each block type can only be destroyed by one character or the other. Run into a block once, or get hit by an enemy twice, and you have to restart the level. This one's okay. It's fun, but I would have preferred a regular platformer instead. Shadowgate was originally a black and white point and click adventure game for Apple computers. So you might think the NES version sucks, right? No, quite the contrary. This version is amazing. This is an incredibly immersive puzzle adventure game. You see everything from a first person view and failure can and will result in you meeting the Grim Reaper or having your game stuck in an unwinnable status. The good news is that the puzzles are actually not too hard. For the most part, they're pretty logical and there are enough visual and contextual clues to hint you at where you need to proceed. And it's a game that does a remarkable job at making you feel alone and somewhat helpless, not helped by the time limit that comes in the form of torches. If that light source ever runs out, you're a goner. You can find more as you explore the castle, but you'll always feel like you have just enough to complete your quest. Now, I first played this game on the Game Boy Color, with a version known as Shadowgate Classic, which is a straight port from the NES version, but the colors are slightly better and the menus are also more intuitive. Between the two, I would recommend the Game Boy Color version, but honestly, this is a really good game either way. And this is also where gaming in the Clinton years got their theme song. There's also a prequel to Shadowgate called Uninvited. Well, I mean, they're two completely separate stories, but they're by the same developer and use the same engine. The Apple port of Uninvited launched first, but the NES got Shadowgate first and Uninvited later. It's basically the same game under a different storyline and with different puzzles. And while I enjoyed this one as well, it does feel a little rougher around the edges than Shadowgate. I feel the puzzles and mansion layout are a bit more confusing, but it's still a good game and it's just as eerie and unsettling as Shadowgate. And I am honestly surprised that Nintendo approved some of these game over screens and descriptions because uh, some of these really go all out. Haunted Halloween 85 is another modern game for the NES and... It's fine. You play as a kid going to school only to realize that your town is suddenly haunted and everyone must turn into a zombie. That's what I gathered at least, because the story text scroll would just not end. This is a pretty standard platformer, though your attacks kind of seem like something more out of a beat-em-up. Your character can take a lot of hits and he becomes progressively more zombified the more he's hit. The enemies are fairly easy to take out as well. If anything, pitfalls were my greatest foe. I also think the first level was poorly chosen because it doesn't look that great. But the following levels look better with some nice gradient backgrounds. Overall, this one's not bad. Hellfighter is another unlicensed bootleg game for the NES and it's kinda good actually. You play as this dude who I swear I've seen him in a different game. Seriously, if you know where this sprite is from, please tell me, I know I've seen him somewhere. This is basically a run and gun and a pretty competent one at that. 
There's a slew of power-ups to collect, which makes your demon hunting far easier. And you can destroy blocks below or above you to open new paths to explore or simply to collect more power-ups. I do feel that some of these stage hazards are overly difficult and I honestly have no idea how you can dodge some of these boss attacks or if dodging is even an option. But the game does give you plenty of lives to make up for it, so yeah, that's okay. But overall, yeah, I kinda like this one. Master of Darkness was Sega's take on Castlevania and it's a damn good one too. Sega didn't even try to hide it either. It looks like Castlevania and it plays like Castlevania. You are an investigator in turn of the century England and your Ouija board tells you that Dracula has risen and it's your job to summon Belmont his ass. The first thing you'll notice, once again, are the graphics. The Master System hardware was really great at producing big sprites and colorful graphics with some nice, crisp visuals. From an art style standpoint, I feel that most of these levels are not that interesting to look at. I mean, taking a stroll down the Thames River or at a wax museum is just not that interesting. But you do have some standout moments. You also have a variety of weapons at your disposal, including your main weapon which can be a dagger, an axe, a cane or a sword, to your sub-weapons like the boomerang, bomb and pistol, all of which handle like the cross, axe and dagger from Castlevania respectively. I find it interesting that you can switch between main weapons often, depending on which items you get, though I'm not sure why the game keeps giving you the dagger icon. It's literally the worst main weapon in the game. Stay away from it and you'll do fine. But overall though, yeah, this game is amazing. This is an awesome Castlevania clone and one that all Master System owners should strive to collect for. Splatterhouse One Paco Graffiti is a spin-off to the Splatterhouse games. You're dead and your girlfriend is mourning you when lightning strikes and revives you, which I think is also a reference to Friday the 13th. But suddenly, oh no, a giant flying pumpkin appears and kidnaps your girlfriend. Don't you just hate it when that happens? So these Splatterhouse games were never really known for their depth and this is no exception. It's a very basic platformer that survives mostly on its style. Sadly though, the style here is not as interesting as the main Splatterhouse trilogy. The over-the-top violence and gore was mostly replaced with humor, like Dracula dancing thriller before flashing you the peace sign, and it's not a good substitute if you ask me. The most interesting thing about this game is that as you defeat enemies, you level up and increase your max health. But honestly, this game gets boring really fast and the visuals just aren't doing it for me. Stick with the original Splatterhouse trilogy. New Ghostbusters 2 is the only good Ghostbusters game for the NES. This was made by Hell Laboratories of Kirby fame and it never launched in the US. You pick your main Ghostbuster and yes, you can pick Winston and the support Ghostbuster and yes, you can pick Rick Moranis and off you go. You only control the main Ghostbuster but the other one will follow behind you or, you know, try to and you need to use your proton pack against the various ghosts while the support Ghostbuster throws a trap underneath. You can hold on to the ghost for a while, but not indefinitely, which means that it's a good idea to have your AI buddy nearby or in a position where he can actually trap the ghosts. Something which isn't always possible. Now, this game is actually quite easy, which is why you go down in one hit. But besides that, yeah, this is a good game. I would still rather play the Genesis game over this one, but finally, the NES gets a good Ghostbusters game. Sweet Home is the go-to horror game everyone always refers back to when talking about 8-bit horror titles. And with good reason, because this game is amazing. This was my first time playing it and I instantly fell in love with this game. Based on a Japanese movie of the same name, you play as a team of documentarians exploring an old mansion that contains frescoes created by a famous painter. However, they become trapped by the spirits that inhabit the house and must now escape. The game plays a lot like a JRPG in that you have random encounters 
a level up system and turn-based combat. But it's also unique in that you control 5 different characters which you can control separately or group them in trees. Additionally, each character has a unique item to them, some of which are necessary to progress like a ladder or a key, while others aren't strictly necessary but are immensely useful like pills that cure your status. You'll also come across additional items and even weapons to help you throughout your journey and so, the game becomes a journey of survival as you try to organize, lead and reorganize your members. And if someone's HP reaches zero, they go down permanently. This is honestly such an interesting game and I highly recommend it. Speaking of horror to movie game adaptations, Nightmare on Elm Street was also adapted into a video game. Once again, after watching the AVGN video on it, I expected this game to suck. And while this one did not surprise me as much as Friday the 13th did, I thought it was fine. You run around the city collecting Freddy's bones from different buildings, and you're pretty much attacked by everything that moves. But man, these are some really generic enemies. Occasionally, your character falls asleep and you move on to the dream world. Here, the monsters become more menacing, but you also gain a ranged attack. And if you find a radio, you can use that to wake up. Some of the boss fights like Freddy's gloves are pretty interesting. And occasionally, you'll have to contend with Freddy himself. And it's interesting to see how they try to incorporate the rules of the movies into the game. But I feel this one is not as clever or well thought out as Friday the 13th. And the game itself is fine, but nothing to write home about. It'll keep you entertained if you're into Nightmare on Helm Street. But I don't think you'll be returning to this one often. Finally, we have Monster Party. Basically, you're a kid walking home when a monster approaches you and asks you for help taking down evil monsters that have taken over his land. You being the good sport you are, accept to help him and the two of you fuse and off you go. Aww, this is a pretty cute game. Look at all the smiling faces. The graphics are nice, the music is cheerful, good hit detection. I see absolutely nothing wrong with Caralho, que é isto? This is an official NES game? Nintendo of America approved this? Were they drunk that day? Damn, this is incredible! And the game is really good too! You need to traverse the various levels, entering doors and defeating many bosses to get a key. Once you find the key, you go towards the exit and use it. And that's it! Finding the key, however, will require a lot of trial and error as well as exploration. You'll also find some neat power-ups, like this one, that lets you switch your body with your demon, allowing you to fly and shoot from a distance for a limited time. I don't really like how your health does not replenish between boss fights, meaning you'll often just have to grind for the occasional health pickup. But honestly, this is a pretty minor complaint. Monster Party is an incredible game and it's definitely worth checking out. And there you have it, a pretty wide selection of 8-bit horror games. I don't think I covered every 8-bit console horror game out there, but I should be pretty close. Are there any games I missed? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I'd like to thank Dash Altaro for becoming my newest Patreon supporter. Because as we all know, all the best things come in dashes. Street Fighter Dash, Mega Man Dash and DoorDash. Anyway, I hope you all have a great day. Bye!